So no pressure, Lewis, but you're going to be on YouTube after your talk is finished. Today. Okay, let's start with verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to go through to verse 16. This then is how you ought to regard us. As servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed, now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the pr procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honoured, we are dishonoured. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus... I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Lewis is going to come up. and We just pray, Lord, help us to receive what you've got to speak to us today. Help us to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here. So yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the passage that I've been tasked with. Um, I think there could probably be a whole uh, a series of preaching uh, just from that passage, talking about um, service and judgment and uh, the whole part of uh, sarcasm. Actually, Rich just mentioned that as well. I've never seen so much sar sarcasm so, so, you know, so clearly defined in the Bible. But yeah. It's a, it's a really, really interesting passage, actually. So this is ch chapter 4, the one that we get to today in the first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, and it's talking about the true apostleship. That's the title in the, in the, that you will see in the Bibles for this, for this, um, for this uh, section. Uh, and as we know, this letter is directed to, the, to people, to a church in Corinth. Uh, this was a church that, ch that Paul himself, the writer, he, he planted. He has spent with them one, one and a half years, pretty much. And then he moved on. He went to other cities. But after he moved on, he started getting reports uh, that there were massive problems with the church in Corinth, that things were not going very well there. And it is these issues that he, trusts, that he tries to address in this, in this letter, in the first, his first letter to the Corinthians. And you can probably break up uh, First Corinthians into five sections, um, five main parts. We fix each section corresponding to one main issue or problem that Paul is trying to address. Um, 
First one being the division of the church, and that's the one we've been, we've been talking about until now. We will discuss that today. Uh, then he's going to move, move on to talk about sexual immoralities. Um, then he's, we'll talk about food. They were this divided about food as well, what they would eat and they could not eat. Then we'll talk about Christian gatherings. And lastly, he will talk about the resurrection, uh, Christ's resurrection. And after Paul left Corinth, um, there was other teachers that came past that, this city to teach at the church. People like Apollos has already been mentioned a few times. Um, Cephas, Peter himself was there as well. And what happened was that people started taking kind of sides and started to form kind of groupies around or gangs around these leaders. You know, I, I think the best one is Apollos. He's, he's the wise one. He's the one that, you know, he's good looking and, you know, he, he knows how to speak. I like Paul, you know, he's the one that actually he's got the temperament and he gets things done, you know. And actually, okay, maybe that wasn't so bad, but what was happening were actually people were starting to be quite disrespectful and talking badly towards one another, depending on, on what leader you were following. So Paul's response to this, and he's saying in the, these first chapters, guys, come on, what's happening here? You know, the church is not, a, is, is, not a, is not a popularity contest. The church is actually a community of people that should not be centered about leaders and how good they are. It is actually a community that should be based around Jesus. And the leaders themselves are servants. And he clarifies this throughout the first four, four, four chapters. Um, and in chapter 3, which is the chapter that we, we discussed last week, um, we looked at uh, Paul, you know, talked about the church being a collective building project that should only be founded and focused in Jesus. And he actually finishes chapter 3 by saying, So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present or future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God." So again, he brings them directly to that point. And he moves, moves on to consolidate what he's been saying in the first three chapters in this chapter four. Um, and in this chapter, he pretty much answers the question, what makes up or what, how a minister of God should, should look like? And what, and what makes us that kind of people or ministers who can serve a life for a lifetime without getting caught up in comparison and judgmentalism, which is basically what the church in Corinth were getting um, uh, diverted with. And he begins his uh, first verses. I've been told I have to press twice. <laughs> Here we go. And he begins his first verses uh, with, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ, as those entrusted with the ministries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And when you look at this uh, first two verses, I've called it the job description and pretty much tells us, you know, the job description of a minister, right, of ministry. We are servants of Christ we have been entrusted with the ministry, with the mysteries of God, and we have to be. We are called to be faithful with these mysteries that we have been entrusted with. Now, when we look at the word minister or ministry, I think it's important to clarify that uh, uh, the Christian Church, in the Christian Church, we are all ministers. The minister is not just Robin a person who is, you know, in charge or, or, you know, leading a church. Actually, according to Hebrews and according to, to Ephesians, Hebrews 13, I think it is, it says specifically the minister in the church is in charge of coaching the ministers in the church. So we are all called to be ministers. And I think the key words that I've highlighted here uh, kind of, uh, describe what a ministry should look like or what a ministry is all about and it's servants, entrusted and faithful. And the first word is servants and the, in this specific pa pa passage servants is used many times throughout the New Testament and throughout the Bible but in this specific passage 
the, the, the Greek word used here was, and excuse my Greek, uh, huperites. And this word was used to uh, describe um, third level galley slaves. These third level galley slaves were basically the guys at the bottom deck of a warship doing the pulling the oar and rowing all day long during war or during. Uh, and this is what Paul once calls the church to regard him as. And this is how he seems himself as. And there will be not just one person, there will be hundreds of guys doing exactly the same thing. This is how he regards himself as a servant of Christ. And I think this tells us that he understood that it's important for us as a church to remember that we, yes, we serve people and we work with people, but ultimately we are Christ servants. We serve Christ. Christ is the boss <laughs> in the church. And no matter how small our task is, or may seem it is, or how big and spectacular our task may be, uh, we are all serving God. And he is the one that, that we do it for. The second word is entrusted. And, of course, servants have to do a job. And the job here that they, we have to do as servants is actually, you know, to maintain or to keep what has been entrusted in our hands. And we see, we see that in the previous uh, chapter, in chapter 3, that we were entrusted as a church to build on this foundation that was Christ, to build the church. And also, we can see that, I think, from Noemi's message a couple of some weeks ago, you know, this uh, great commission that we have been given. We have been entrusted this good news and take, take them out into the world and share them with others. Again and again, Paul says that we are servants who have been entrusted with letting people know who Jesus really is. And we do this by serving people in Jesus' name. We do this by uh, sharing his message in Jesus' name. And we do this by praying in Jesus' name. We are servants who have been entrusted. And the third word that he uses in these two, in these two verses is uh, faithful. And Paul says that we must prove faithful um, to actually be considered a good servant. Basically, that's, that's what he's saying. We must um, prove faithful with what has been entrusted to us. And I think a good image of this is uh, a waiter in a restaurant. Uh, you know, you get to a restaurant and you usually get welcomed. You get sat down in a table and then somebody comes and, and you know, this person comes and brings you the menu. Uh, you know, he, he's assigned your table and this person, you know, makes sure that you have enough water all the time. He brings the glasses, he brings the forks. Uh, sometimes they do a good job of it, sometimes they don't, yes. But actually, you know, this is what, and they, they are servants, waiters of this, of this, of this table. They're, what they have been entrusted is a table or a few tables and they are faithful to, with that. They make sure that the people that sit down on those tables are actually always being taken care of. Have they got enough water? Are they being pleased? Have you got any questions about the menu? And this is pretty much a good image to have, uh, you know, when we say, according to Paul, we are to be servants. And that is our role, that we have been given a trust, a table. And I don't know what your table is. Sometimes when we talk about a trust from God, we talk about a big ministry. You know, our table may be our family, our table may be our children. Our table may be a school. It may be a church. It may be a, a, you know, a person that, we've been, that God is asking us to stand next to or support with. We are to be faithful with this table that God has given to us. And at this moment, I want to, you know, Robin asked earlier to, to give some testimonies. Lola's got a fantastic testimony of one table she was asked to serve in the last couple of years. She shared it with Rich and with myself, but I think it's so nice. I wanted to share it, so. Lola, you can, <laughs> you wanna come up? This has not been planned. <laughs> and I'm gonna get it later on, but I feel, I feel it's, it's, it's worth sharing. I just thought, maybe it was not right about for everyone, but it's, it's for the glory of God. 
as you know, I always pray for the children I work uh, with. Uh, and I mean, this is my third year with this particular child. And he finds it really difficult to take part in group activities and well, school life in, in general. Uh, and on Friday, it was our, our sports day. And for the first time uh, in his academic life, he was really happy to do every single activity. He was enjoying himself. He didn't care about losing or winning. He was just happy. And I was not just grateful for him, but also to he mom having a good time because usually through the years, she's always anxious, predicting what's going to happen, the out bars, the tantrum. And this year, I just could see her face. She was so happy. And I, I was so grateful with God. To, to see that picture. Uh, probably this is my last year with him, so I just was really happy to see some fruit of, of the work and the prayers, to be honest, in his life. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen, and that's, that's precisely what Jesus was, right? And in John 17, when Jesus uh, finished his ministry, he said, uh, he prayed and he said, Father, I've been faithful. I've been faithful with that which you have given me. He was faithful in his service until the very, very last prayer. And sometimes we want to give up. We might get tired. Um, we might get discouraged. Um, we might not see results. <laughs> but I think God is calling us to carry on being faithful. Keep serving. Keep filling that glass of water for that person. Because that that person is getting served and God is ultimately working in that person. And this may, this may be a question for us today. You know, what table, what table is God preparing, is asking us to serve today? Um, you know, what talent do I have uh, in, us to, in order to give to God today? How can I serve and how can I be faithful at this point in time in my life? So that's the first two verses. I told you you can do a whole preach just in the first two. Um, and then, you, then he moves on to verses three to six. And basically what he talks about here is God being the ultimate judge. And, uh, you know, I think that the Apostle Paul here reminds us that, you know, ultimately we are all going to get judged by God. And our, our ministries are going to be judged by God. And he actually mentions three uh, you know, free judges, which we should really not, not, not that we don't, shouldn't be paying attention with, but are really not there to be judging us. And one of them is by you, and he's, he's talking to the, to, the, to the Corinthian church, so he's basically by the church, uh, what, he's, what he's mentioning there. The second one is a human court, and the third one is by, well, he says myself, so it's by ourselves. And firstly, he talks about the church. And the church is really an encourager. And I think we were talking about it earlier. I think Noreen, uh, the, the um, testimony was about, you know, how as a church we can pray together and God works. So the church is here to, to encourage us, to do fellowship, to advise. The church is our enabler. The church is our family. Uh, but according to Paul here, the church is not the ultimate judge of our ministry. And we should not do things to please the church as a judge. We should do things in our lives to please God as our leader. The second judge is the human court. And here we're talking about more about the, the people outside of church, the world. And you know, how does the world, what does the world think of us? Um, and I think, yes, we need to be concerned about how we share the good news with the world, how we are coming across that love of God, that mercy, and everything else but ultimately you know we should not do things to please the world if we are not cool enough if we don't have enough followers in Facebook or Instagram or you probably see my age when I mention Facebook first <laughs> uh, and all these other platforms you get out there that's that's my limit <laughs> um, and I think the risk here is that we can become so involved in trying to decorate the message that we are giving that ultimately we are, we are, the real message of the gospel may get lost along the way if we try to decorate it too much. So human courts are not a good judge. 
the church is not a good judge. And thirdly, Paul says, by the way, we ourselves are not a good judges, not good judges of our ministries. And if we became our own judges, I think that the probability is that we would either be too harsh with ourselves and we will end up giving up or in deep depression, or we could be too easy with ourselves and we could actually end up, uh, you know, being too mediocre maybe or end up with too much pride. And so instead, what Paul is saying is, let the Lord be the judge. And this word judge can be confusing sometimes. You know, we make decisions every day of our lives. This is good for me. This is not good for me. Uh, this way, maybe I should do this, these sort of things that it helps me. Uh, maybe I should get, you know, these sort of people I shouldn't get too close with because that's, they, they are not good for me. You know, these are decisions that we make. The word judgment here has been used mainly uh, in regards to who is going to ultimately say well done to our ministry. Who is the one who is ultimately going to put the stamp of approval in our ministry and in our lives and how we lift our lives? And that is God. And Paul is saying here that, you know, if God has asked you to do something, if he's, if he's put it in your heart clearly and he wants you to do something and he's put a person in your mind and in your heart, even if it doesn't seem appropriate, even if, you know, the world doesn't seem to care, if it may seem, you know, something very little, so Paul says, keep being faithful and keep, keep doing it. Then he moves on to verse number five, and he's, where he talks about, you know, uh, therefore to judge nothing before the appointed time. And this, is, this, this verse five is all about, you know, being, uh, being the judgment coming and being a matter of the right time and the right person. And the right time is God's appointed time, which is not yet and not now. You know, it will be the appointed time until the Lord comes. That will be when the Lord comes. And the right person being God. And when we think about this, you know, uh, he, I think he says here, uh, at that, in that time, uh, the Lord will bring to, to light. Uh, all what is hidden in, in darkness will be exposed, the motives of the heart. And when we think about this exposing of the motives of the heart, it usually comes a bit... I find it a bit, a bit like scary. Oh my God, he's going to expose me. Uh, when I, but actually, I don't think that's Paul's intent here. He's actually, you know, he's, he's, when we get to that point, uh, God will actually honor us. And that's what he finishes the verse with. At that time, each will receive the praise from God. All those good uh, deeds that you've, or all, the, all of those good thoughts that have led to good deeds that you have done in your life, that nobody may have seen, that may seem insignificant, God will, will expose those as well. And he will honor you, and he will honor, and, and he will honor how he has worked through you in your life. So on, ultimately, the honor will go to God, because it will, it's him working through us, right? So we will stand blameless before him, because of the work of Christ. So, of course... All the glory goes back to God because it is because of the work of Christ that we're going to stand blameless. And that's what he mentions and, and that's what he refers to in verse number six, uh, where he says, We recognize that God is the ultimate judge and not a person or a bunch of people. Then the whole issue of pride goes away, doesn't it? Because it's ultimately, it comes from God and it goes back to God. And we ourselves, we are just the instrument. According to verse one, we are just the third level galley slaves working together for one purpose and that is how we carry out our ministry finally um, Paul, so Paul goes on to talk about the attitudes of ministry um, and you know he clearly highlights uh, in these two verses two attitudes uh, one a, a negative attitude that were being you know shown by the Corinthians the arrogance and then he goes on to, uh, to highlight a positive attitude in ministry, and that is the one of humility. And he basically discusses how, uh, you know, the arrogance got built up in the Corinthians' lives. Uh, the first one, uh, talking about, you know, that they were the exception, that, you know, everybody is important, but I am the exception. And it seems like they were starting to boast about the truth that had been shared to them, Oh, that they were taught as if they had discovered it themselves. Uh, so Paul asks them, asks them the question, 
what do you have that you that have not received? Everything that you have, even the, even the truth that you have, the gospel that you have, you have received it. So why are you boasting about? You know, basically, you are not a special, <laughs> or you're not, you are not that special. Uh, you are just like the, every other church in Ephesus and, you know, all the other churches around. Everything that you have comes from God. The wisdom, the knowledge, and the spiritual gifts that they would be boasting a lot about. Secondly, is the thinking about that they didn't need anything else. They didn't need anybody else. They were, you know, enough for, for themselves. And here Paul uses some big sarcasm, you know, to show the message of how arrogant they had, they had been. You know, how they thought of themselves as kings, uh, having everything that they needed, that they were already rich. And Paul said, how I wish that was true. And of course, uh, for us, this helps, this highlights the great danger of thinking that we need, don't need anybody uh, else in our ministries or around us. You know, we need people. We need people to support us. We need to be supporting people, people to be encouraging us and to, for advising us or even correcting us in some, in, at some points. And the first one, the, sorry, the third one is the, the one that, you know, I need to look good for God's sake. Verses 9 to 10. So I need to look good, you know, otherwise the world may think I am not a, I am not a good Christian. Uh, and he talks about a procession here. Uh, when the Romans would win a, a battle or would conquer a city or a country, they would will, they will have a procession in the Roman city. And then at the, at the front of the procession would be all the conquerors, you know, the, the, the soldiers and the, the guys that were being praised. And then right at the back of that procession, there will be the, the slaves coming with them, all the, uh, what you would call the war, the prisoners of war. And he says that at the end of that procession, this is how he viewed himself, like men condemned to die in the arena. That's how we look like, he said. And appearances can become very important in our ministry. And Paul points out that there is a great danger in needing to look wise or needing to look strong. There is a great danger in focusing on how we look to the world. And there are times where we meet, where, when we will be honored and our faith will be exposed and it will be, you know, uh, uh, public. But actually there will be times when we will need to be weak and we will be maybe dishonored for God's sake. And that is in order for him to do his purpose on us, but also to do for him to do, to work his purpose through us, maybe to other people and via our testimony. True servants are evaluated not by how or who they serve. Sorry, true servants are evaluated by how or who they serve, not by who, how they serve or how they appear to be. Um, Jesus himself was dishonored, regarded as weak, and sometimes we will face the same things. So how do we face this? You know, how do we face... Uh, having to be dishonored in God's, in the God's sake? Uh, how do we face admitting that we are not, that we need other people sometimes, that we are not the exception? And that's where humility comes in. And then verses 11 to 13, uh, we can read, we can see that Paul needed a, a lot of humility. And he, he talks about, you know, how he was being, uh, how he saw himself on, on his daily life. You know, he felt hungry, brutally treated, mistreated, homeless, cursed, persecuted. He, he, and he ends up, he felt like he was being the scum of the earth. And yet again, we see Paul with, as a great apostle, and he was a great apostle who planted all these churches. And that's, not, that's by nowhere near what he saw himself as. And the, pro, the, the truth is we will probably never have to go through what Paul went through in our lives. But the question is, do I realize that as I follow Jesus, I'm, I will, I may have to face even this, what Paul went through. And to have humility is to realize that even if I was to face this unfair treatment, judgment, being cursed, being persecuted, and all these other things, that that will not change who I am in Jesus Christ. And the fact that going through uh, something like this humbly will actually be a testimony for the people around us and God working and other people through us. As we do ministry in a broken world, uh, you know, we, we have two options. Uh, we either 
um, pretend that it's not there, a bit like the Corinthians were doing, and actually just do it just ourselves, and we are enough for each other. But we actually get involved, like Paul did, and we reach out, and we minister to people, and we go down, and we, uh, you know, help people to stand up. Jesus was not concerned about his appearance at all. He was concerned. He was more concerned about the love of God on the cross. He was more concerned about loving us. And I got, you know, this testimony, I, I assume, and most of you will know, I don't know if you said it before, or maybe I've said it too many times, I don't know, but it, I came to God through football team. And um, yes, <laughs> that's why I do football. And uh, there was this, basically, the, 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 the coach or the manager of the team, he will make us pray before every game. And we will go around the country, we'll go to Bournemouth International uh, Tournament and the Leicester International Tournament. And every time before a game, he will make us all pray. Whether we like to or not, he said, everybody's going to pray. <laughs> of course, that didn't fall well with some of the parents. Uh, and he was criticized about it big time. I think at one point, he actually had to move to another team uh, because we, uh, he was getting too much criticism from, from, from our team or from the parents and our teams. And, you know, I don't know if, if Alex, his name is Alex, if he realizes the impact those prayers made to us, because that's how I became a Christian. And not just me, you know, I was the first person in my family to become a Christian and how my whole family has become Christians. And I know it's not just me, it's actually other guys in the team that also became Christians, are Christians nowadays, you know. And yes, he was criticized. And yes, he probably looked like a really strong decision at the time. I don't know if it was right or not, but he did it. But that's, that is the result of it, you know. And sometimes we don't see it. I mean, this was, I was a teenager, so this is a long time ago, uh, late 90s. Five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, it goes to show that we, what we do, we will not necessarily see the results now. We might see the results many, in many, you know. We might not even see them. We will see them when God, God exposes, uh, brings everything to light. Amen. Um, and sometimes we will, take we will have to take criticisms and have people pointing at us. But the impact on God, of God in the lives, that's what it's ultimately all about. Amen. So let's pray. I, I mean, I could go on forever. If you read verses 14 onwards, it gets even better. But I think let's, let's leave it here and let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word today, Lord. And we, we thank you. Uh,